On November 10th, 1821, in Hamburg, Germany, a baby boy was born to a Jewish couple, David and Rosalie Cohen. They named him Herman. At the age of four and a half, Herman began taking piano lessons, and by the age of 11, his music talents were so remarkable that his mother decided to take him off to Paris to study music. Soon after arriving, the great Hungarian pianist Franz Liszt heard Herman play and was so impressed by his abilities, they accepted him as a pupil. Now, that was no small honor. At that time, Franz Liszt was easily the most highly regarded pianist in the world. In fact, he's still regarded as perhaps the greatest pianist that's ever lived. He was wildly famous also. He was sort of a 19th century version of a modern rock and roll star. Liszt had fully intended to leave all this worldly fame and fortune behind and go and study for the priesthood, but he was blocked by his own Catholic father. After that, his life began falling apart until, unfortunately, by the age of 23, when he took Herman Cohen on as a pupil, Liszt was leading a decadent bohemian lifestyle, lifestyle very similar to our modern rock and roll stars. Herman soon became Litt's favorite pupil. Though he's barely a teenager, he began traveling and playing concerts with him and spending countless hours in the companionship of immoral people, falling deeper and deeper into the clutches of sin. Herman wrote of these times, quote, My companions were early at work to fill my head with all those dreadful doctrines which, springing up from the bottom of hell, were creeping out all over the surface of this Parisian den. Soon this head of only 14 years made room for atheism, pantheism, communism, socialism, riot, massacre of the wealthy, abolition of marriage, terrorism, and the community of enjoyment and all pleasures. Evil makes great strides. I soon became one of the most zealous of the propagandists of sects that are sworn to change the face of the world. Close quote. During all this time, Herman became impossibly vain and arrogant and such a slave to his passions that in spite of the fact he made tons of money, he blew it all in gambling and high living. For years, his life was almost totally out of control. He describes those times. I was unbelievably successful in everything I did. And all the seductions of the world seized my spirit. My life was at that time a complete abandonment to all my whims and indulgences. Was I happier for it? No. The thirst for happiness which was devouring me was not quenched in the least. I was gagged, enchained by these fetters of slavery. I understood that I had to break these fetters, and I couldn't. All the young people of my acquaintance lived like me, looking for pleasure everywhere it was offered, arduously desiring riches so as to be able to pursue all their inclinations to satisfy all their whims. As for thoughts of God, they never entered into their mind. Close quotes. And so Herman spent his teen years with fame, fortune, and unhappiness. He's a miserable slave of sin. Till one Friday evening in May of 1847, when he's 26 years old, the music director at a church in Paris asked Herman to come play the organ during benediction. At the very moment of benediction, Herman was overcome with a strange sensation. Quote, My mind found itself withdrawn from the agitation of the world, penetrated by something totally unknown to it previously. I was constrained to bow against my will. Coming back the following Friday, I had the same experience, and suddenly the thought touched me to become a Catholic, close quote. A few days later, he's passing the church and heard the bell ring for Mass. He walked in and wound up staying through three Masses. That same afternoon, something drew him to church again. When he walked in, he found the Blessed Sacrament exposed, and all of a sudden, some power pushed him down onto his knees. Quote, I felt, as it were, a great weight descend upon me, which forced me to my knees, yes, even to bow to the ground in adoration. Close quote. Later that day, he went to a friend's house and borrowed a prayer book so he could study up on this mysterious Catholic devotion. He wound up spending the whole night thinking about the Most Blessed Sacrament. He wasn't sure what to do next, but he started attending Mass frequently. He found himself more and more excited and filled with interior joy, but he was still unsure of what it all meant. In August, still in this condition, he went to Germany to give a concert and attended Sunday Mass. 
At the very moment of the elevation, he burst into tears. Quote, I had often wept in my childhood, but never such tears as these. Spontaneously, as if by intuition, I began to make a general confession to God of all the enormous sins committed since my childhood. I saw them there, piled up before me by the thousands, hideous, repulsive, worthy of the wrath of the sovereign judge. And yet I also felt an unfamiliar calm which spread its balm on my soul, that the God of mercy would forgive me these, that he would take pity on my sincere contrition, on my bitter sorrow. Yes, I felt that he would give me grace and that he would accept in expiation my firm resolution to love him above everything else and to convert to him from then on. When I left this church, I was already a Christian in my heart. Close quote. Herman attributed this miraculous conversion to Our Lady. When he got back to Paris, he asked a friend to introduce him to a priest who listened to Herman's story with kindness. Herman wrote, quote, This meeting suddenly rid me of one of the prejudices most firmly and deeply rooted in my mind. I was afraid of priests. I knew them only by reading novels which presented them to us as intolerant men, constantly making threats of excommunication. And I found myself in the presence of a learned man, modest, good, open, expecting everything from God and nothing from himself. Close quote. The priest began to instruct Herman, who would then go straight home and lock himself in the room in order to study the teachings of the church. His miraculous conversion took place on August 8th. It was so complete a conversion, and he studied so seriously that the priest decided that Herman was ready for baptism only three weeks later on the Feast of St. Augustine, August 28th. At his baptism, Herman saw bathed in a brilliant light an apparition of our Lord, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the saints. By November, he was convinced he had a vocation to the priesthood, but there were lots of obstacles, huge obstacles, not the least of which was paying off his gigantic debt. His gambling debts were something like 30,000 francs. It took him two years of teaching music to wipe out the debt. The whole while, he spent growing in virtue and gained the experience of living in the world as a practical Catholic rather than a party animal. At the end of the two years, he consulted a learned priest. Should I become a secular priest or religious? Have you the courage to let yourself be spit upon in the face and say no word? Yes. Then go be a monk. So he tried to join the Carmelites, but he's refused. Without a special dispensation from Rome, a Jew could not be admitted. And Rome, fully aware of his sordid past, this was a famous man, refused to grant Herman the dispensation. Herman traveled to Rome and pled his case. The dispensation was then granted, and he returned to France and was admitted into Carmel on the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, July 16, 1849. Herman wrote to his mother, quote, The religious order I have entered originated among the Jews 930 years before Jesus Christ. The prophet Elijah of the Old Testament founded it on Mount Carmel in Palestine. It is an order of real Jews of children of the prophets who waited for the Messiah, who believed in him when he came. They have survived to our time, living in the same manner with the same bodily deprivations and the same spiritual joys that were there about 2,800 years ago. They still bear today the name of the Order of Mount Carmel. Among these religious, those stemming from the Reform by St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross are a separate group called the Discalced Carmelites. This is the branch that I belong to. Why follow this life? To imitate the life Jesus led when he came to save men through suffering. Obedience, humiliations, poverty, the cross. This is the life I have chosen. Close quote. When this news reached his family, his father cursed him and disinherited him. In July of 1850, after Herman had been in Carmel for a year, his mother arrived from Hamburg, came to the monastery, and asked to see her son. He arrived in the company of the novice master. She swooned, fell into his arms, refused to be consoled, generally had a histrionic fit and carried on till he finally had to leave and go to the divine office. She begged him to come back to the world with him, but he held firm. She spent a week there, caterwauling, carrying on like this, but he held firm. Finally, she left, cursing those who had taken her son away from him. Incredibly enough, in April of 1851, now this is less than four years after his baptism and less than two years after he went into Carmel, He was ordained a priest. His name and religion had been changed from Herman Cohen to Father Augustine Maria, the Most Blessed Sacrament. 
Initially, he was sent to the south of France to preach. And his preaching there resulted in the conversion of a great number of sinners and many Jews. In April of 1854, he was sent to Paris, the scene of his previously wild life. His sermon began, quote, My brothers, my first act when appearing in this Christian pulpit must be the making of amends for the scandals that I previously made the mistake of committing in this city. What right, you could tell me, do you have to preach, you whom we have seen dragging yourself around in the mud of an immodest immorality and openly professing every kind of error? Yes, my brothers, I confess that I have sinned against heaven and against you. The mother of Jesus revealed the Eucharist to me. I met Jesus, I met my God, and soon I became a Christian. I requested holy baptism, and the holy water flowed on me. Instantly, all my sins, those horrible sins of 25 years of crime, were wiped away. My soul instantly became pure and innocent. God, my brothers, has forgiven me. Do not forgive me as well. Close quote. He turned to a group of young men present and begged them to follow him and share in his happiness. Many of the people present, including some of his former companions in sin, were touched by grace and converted. Father Augustine Marie prayed fervently for the conversion of his family, and he was granted the grace to see ten members of his family enter the church, including two of his brothers and one sister, but his mother remained Jewish to the end. His superior sent Father Augustine Marie throughout France, Switzerland, Ireland to preach. Blessed Pius the Ninth sent him to, Ire- to England to restore the Carmelite order. Within two years of Father Augustine's arrival, there were seven houses, including two in London. These were the first monasteries erected since Henry VIII had destroyed everything. In spite of his weak health, he was constantly being sent here and there. As he said, in spite of my conversion, I am always the wandering Jew. In June of 1862, Father Augustine Marie found himself in Rome. During his time there, he caught up with an old friend whom he hadn't seen in many, many years. This old friend had also had a major conversion, perhaps as a result of the intense prayers of Father Augustine Marie. And he was now a diocesan cleric and a third order Franciscan secular. Franz Liszt had returned to the faith of his youth. They visited and played the piano together at a Carmelite monastery, and Liszt received communion from his former pupil. In a marked contrast to their former lives and a striking testimony to the mercy of God, the two old friends walked side by side, praying the stations during the solemn way of the cross held at the Colosseum. In 1868, Father Augustine Marie was stricken by glaucoma, and the doctors recommended surgery. Instead, he went to Lourdes, where he made an ovina and washed his eyes every day with the water. On the ninth day, he experienced a sudden and miraculous cure. Our Lady had granted Father Augustine Marie a miracle. During the Franco-Prussian War, he was assigned to a POW camp near Berlin to take care of some 5,300 French prisoners of war. In January of 1871, while giving the last rites to prisoners dying of smallpox, he caught it himself. When Father Augustine Marie was told that the end was near, he beamed with joy. The evening of January 19th, he made his last confession peacefully, and then he re- after he received Holy Viaticum, he said, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. His calm breathing continued until about 10 o'clock the next morning when he asked the sister who sat up with him, Can you sing the Te Deum? No, Father, I'm sorry. The Salve Regina? Yes, Father. Then let us sing it together. They sang it, and he died. There's a lot here to ponder. For the sake of time, we'll just consider a few of the lessons that he can teach us. Young people, you should specially ponder this. First lesson, the absolute importance of avoiding sin and sinful companions. Here's Father speaking of his own youth. Quote, My companions filled my head with all those dreadful doctrines springing up from the bottom of hell were creeping all over. Evil makes great strides. I soon became one of the most zealous propagandists of sects sworn to change the face of the earth, close quote. Second lesson, the absolute importance of virtue, of leading a virtuous life and avoiding the danger of high living and worldliness. He used to say, quote, the most important thing 
is not to acquire a taste for the things of this world. The effect of daily prayer is precisely to disillusion us as to the attractiveness of all these things and to arouse in us the desire for Jesus alone. The God of love is jealous. He wishes to reign alone, to be loved, tasted, desired. Close quote. Finally, no matter how bad we've been, no matter how bad, we can become holy. The grace of God that worked miracles in the life of Herman Cohen, that grace can work miracles in our own lives, no matter how bad we've been. Although he hasn't been canonized yet, so far he's been declared venerable, I consider him a saint for modern times. Since he's a venerable, that means he still needs miracles to be beatified and canonized. We can turn to him and pray, especially for the conversion of our Jewish friends, for the conversion of our worldly friends and relatives, for the conversion of wayward youth or any party animals we happen to know. Let's close with some thoughts from Father Gustin Marie. Quote, Where are you, happiness? I have searched for happiness in the fashionable life, in the giddiness of balls and parties. I have searched for it in the possession of gold, in the emotions of gambling, in the close friendship of famous men, in all the pleasures of the mind and the senses. The majority of men are deceived as to the very nature of happiness, and they look for it where it is not to be found. They love happiness. And Jesus Christ, the only happiness possible, is not loved. Oh my God, is it possible that love is not loved? Why? Because it is not known. People study everything except him. All of you who listen to me, must it then be a Jew? Who Last week we heard the story of Herman Cohen, the Jewish musical prodigy, who uh, in, by his teen years had risen to great fame and fortune, and in the process uh, became a slave of sin, blowing his money and gambling and high living. We saw how he was completely converted at a Sunday Mass during the elevation of the Blessed Sacrament, and that after overcoming all kinds of difficulties, he was admitted into Carmel on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, July 16th, 1849. We saw that at that point, his father cursed him and disinherited him. His mother came to the monastery, asked to see her son, and when he arrived in the company of a novice master, she went into histrionic fits, swooning, falling into his arms, refusing to be consoled, weeping, crying, and carrying on, begging him to leave with her, but that he held firm that finally, after a week of this short of behavior, she left, cursing all those who had taken her son away from her. We also saw that, incredibly enough, less than four years after his baptism and less than two years after entering Carmel, he was ordained to the priesthood, and his name and religion was changed from Herman Cohen to Father Augustine Marie of the Most Blessed Sacrament. He's now venerable. We saw that Father Augustine Marie prayed fervently for the conversion of his family and he's granted the grace to see ten members of his family enter the church, but his mother remained Jewish to the end. and She died on December 13, 1855, without converting, without being baptized. So we'll pick up the story there. Shortly after his mother died, Father Augustine went to visit a friend of his, a parish priest in a small town, a small town named Ars. Father Augustine Marie told his friend, the curie of ours, the story of his mother's death. St. John Vianney, that's the parish priest there, told Father Augustine Marie, quote, Hope, hope, you will one day on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception receive a letter which will be very consoling to you. Close quote. Now this prophecy was fulfilled six years later. On December 8, 1861, which is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, when a Jesuit priest handed Father Augustine Marie a letter. Now, this letter was written to Father Augustine Marie by a woman who had died a very holy death. Here's the letter. I will read it to you, the translation. Quote, On the 18th of October, after Holy Communion, I found myself in one of those moments of intimate union with our Lord, wherein he so sweetly makes me feel his presence in the sacrament of his love, that it seems to me as if faith were no longer necessary in order to believe in it. After some moments, he made his voice audible to me, 
and was pleased to give me some explanations relative to a conversation that I had had the previous evening. I remembered then that in this conversation, one of my friends had expressed to me her astonishment that our Lord, who promised everything to prayer, had nevertheless remained deaf to those prayers of Father Herman, so often offered up for the conversion of his mother. Her surprise amounted almost to discontent, and I had found some difficulty in making her understand that we must adore the justice of God and not seek to penetrate his secrets. I have the boldness to ask our Lord how it was that he, who is goodness itself, could have resisted the prayers of Father Herman and not grant the conversion of his mother. This was his answer, our Lord. Why will your friend always seek to sound the secrets of my justice and try to penetrate into mysteries that she cannot understand? Tell her that I owe my grace to no one, that I give to whomsoever I please, and in acting thus, I do not cease to be just and justice itself. But let her know also that sooner than fail in the promises that I have made to prayer, I would overthrow the heavens and the earth, and that every prayer that has my glory and the salvation of souls for its object is always heard when it has the necessary qualities. He also said, and to prove this truth to you, I will let you know what took place at the moment of the death of Father Augustine's mother. I was made to understand the moment that the mother of Father Herman was on the point of breathing her last, when she seemed deprived of consciousness and life was almost gone. Mary, our good mother, presented herself before her divine son, and prostrating herself at his feet, said to him, Grace, mercy, O my son, for this soul that is about to perish. Another moment, and it will be lost, lost for all eternity. The soul of his mother is what is dearest to him. A thousand times he has consecrated it to me. He has confided it to the tenderness, to the solicitude of my heart. Can I allow it to perish? This soul is mine. I want it. I claim it as a heritage, as the price of thy blood, and of my sorrows at the foot of thy cross. Hardly had the, had the most holy virgin ceased to speak, when a grace, strong, mighty, escaped from the source of all graces, the adorable heart of Jesus, and fell upon the soul of that poor dying Jewess, and triumphed instantly over its obstinacy. The soul immediately turned with loving confidence toward him whose mercy pursued her, even in the arms of death. And she said, O Jesus, God of the Christians, God whom my son adores, I believe, I hope in thee, have mercy on me. In this cry, which was heard by God alone, and which came from the lowest depths of the heart of the dying woman, there were included sincere regrets for her obstinacy and her sins, the desire of baptism, the explicit wish to receive it, and to live according to the rules and precepts of our holy religion if she could return to life. This outburst of faith and hope in Jesus was the last sentiment of this soul. As she was uttering it before the throne of divine mercy, the feeble threads that still held her in her earthly tenement were broken, and she threw herself at the feet of him who had been her savior before being her judge. After having shown me all these things, our Lord added, Make this known to Father Augustine. It is a consolation that I wish to grant to his long sufferings, in order they may everywhere bless and cause to be blessed the goodness of my mother's heart, and her power over mine. An entire stranger to the Reverend Father Herman, the poor sick woman that has just penned these lines, is happy to think that they will bring consolation and balm to the ever-bleeding wound of his heart, the heart of a son and a priest. She presumes to ask of him the alms of his fervent prayers, and she hopes that he will not refuse them to one, who, although unknown to him, is united to him by the sacred bonds of the same faith and the same hopes. Close quote. We have a dying anti-Catholic Jewess on the verge of hurtling into hell, saved literally at the last moment by the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There's a lot to ponder there. Let's just briefly consider three points. The importance of hope, 
the awesome responsibility each one of us has as a Catholic and the absolute importance of each one of us to have a true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. First, hope. We all know hopeless cases. Every one of us has friends, relatives, even enemies who either aren't Catholic at all or else they are, but they're going to land smack dab in hell unless something miraculous happens. We all know helpless cases. The salvation of Rosalie Cohen, Father Augustine Marie's mother, and she'd be a hopeless case if ever there were one. Her salvation ought to fill us with hope for the salvation of our so-called hopeless cases. Second point, the awesome responsibility that we each have as Catholics. Anytime God gives us a right, he also gives us a duty. The fact that we have the right to turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary and beg her for the salvation of those whom we love and hold dear means that we have the duty to do just that for those for whom we are most responsible to pray for, our immediate family and our godchildren. That's at the least we have that duty. But we shouldn't stop there. There are people that literally won't be saved unless we pray for them. That's not an exaggeration. That's the fabric of reality. God has poured out his mercy on us by giving us the true faith. And he expects us to beg for his mercy to be poured out on others less fortunate. And when we consider the infinite value of even one soul, a soul so priceless that he would have gone through everything he went through in his incarnation, passion, and death on the cross for even one soul. When we consider the infinite value of one soul and that God expects us to pray for the salvation of those who most need his mercy and that there are people that won't be and can't be saved unless we pray for them, then we get, begin to get a glimmer of the awesome responsibility we have as Catholics, the responsibility we have to pray for those that haven't been given what we've been given. Third, the absolute importance of each one of us to have a true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the story of Rosalie Cohen, we get a glimpse of the incredible power Our Lady's prayers have before the throne of justice. When she asks her son to spare a soul, it just plain, flat happens. That's how it works. We need to be devoted to Our Lady. We need to be faithful in laying our prayers at, for the salvation of our hopeless cases at her feet every day, begging her to take them under her mantle. We could place a list of those we pray for under a statue on our altar at home, say a memorari for them every day, Remember them in our rosary every day. Light a candle before her altar for them. If we're faithful and we're fervent in our prayers, we have every reason for hope. As St. Alphonsus says, there is no one, however wicked, who Mary does not save by her intercession when she wishes. She interceded for Rosalie Cohen because her son asked her. Does anyone think our prayers can obtain the same graces for the people we pray for? If you think that, think again. She's our mother. We have the right to turn to the Blessed Mother and beg her for the salvation of those we love and hold dear. And if we're faithful and fervent about these prayers, we have every reason and every hope that she'll intercede for our hopeless cases. What? Mother, loving mother is not ignore prayers like that. We ought to be filled with hope. After all, in the Hail Holy Queen, what do we call her? We call her our hope because 